How is the peace he wished for to be achieved? Through the mutual respect and goodwill of all beings, of course. And how is that respect to be achieved? Samakro's smile faded. By proving beyond any doubt that the Ascendancy can and will respond to an attack with overwhelming force. Indeed. Did you hear your name as General Skywalker? I did. Why? Have you heard of me? Thrawn caught Cheery's eye as he touched the mute button. Interesting coincidence. You follow a long history written by the Jedi where they choose what they believe to be morally correct instead of what is strategically sound. What's up, Meta Nerds? This complete life of Mithra Narodu, or Thrawn, is by far the largest series yet. Just in canon, it spans six books, several different comic series, a major role in a multi-season show, and tons of other sources. It all comes out to what will be six parts. From his earliest memories in the Unknown Regions, his rise through the Chiss Ascendancy, involving run-ins with Anakin Skywalker, and how he became involved with the Emperor, concealing his true, hidden mission as he worked to eradicate the growing rebel movement, culminating in his mysterious disappearance. Let's begin his epic tale. Mithra Narodu, with the core name of Thrawn, was a Chiss male, a species considered near-human, originating from the planet Rentor in the Unknown Region a perilous and uncharted expanse of the galaxy, referred to by its inhabitants as the Chaos. This region presented navigational challenges due to the supernovae, black holes, gravity wells, and other unfamiliar phenomena. The boy's original court name was Varon, belonging to the Kivu family, a small and impoverished group within the Chiss Ascendancy, which governed a section of the unknown region. Born around 59 BBY, as Kivu Ranuru, he had a Force-sensitive older sister named Kivu Rick Ardok, or taking the core of those three names, Vorika. At the age of three, she was selected to become a Skywalker Navigator, a role necessary for guiding the Chiss through the unknown regions, where navigation computers were scarce. This extraordinary ability, known as Third Sight, usually emerged in young Chiss girls but vanished as they matured. Voron attended a Rentor Academy and excelled academically catching the attention of various ruling families. The Myth family, in particular, dispatched an aristocra named Myth or Fianco to assess Varon's potential. Subsequently, Thrawn attended another academy on Rentor, where he captured the attention of Myth or Akiard, known as Thraki, the patriarch of the Myth family. Thraki enlisted his friend Labaki, later to be known as General Bakif, to take notice of Varon and introduce him to aristocra Myth or Fianco, core name Thurfian. At that time, Supreme General Bakif had recently formed the Chiss Expansionary Defense Fleet when Thurfian visited Varon on Rentor. Kivu was about as obscure a family as the Chiss Ascendancy had ever spawned. If you don't bring Varon in, he won't have another chance until next year. Would that be such a catastrophe? Bakif's face hardened. Yes, I believe it would. Following this visit, Varon was promptly accepted into the Myth family as a Merit Adoptive, changing his core name to Thrawn. This adoption into the Myth family involved an elaborate formal ceremony and occurred around the year 39 BBY. Following his induction, Thrawn was relocated to the Taharim Academy on Naporar, the planet where much of the Chiss expansionary defense fleet operated from, instead of what have traditionally would have been located on Scylla. Before this, Thrawn had never experienced space travel. Eager to familiarize himself with the ship, he explored the Tamra's Bridge, even venturing into a restricted area. There, he encountered a melancholic 13-year-old girl named Alastav, unaware that she was a Skywalker navigator nearing the end of her third sight powers, assigned with navigating the Tamra to Neporar as a test of her abilities. Alastav was instructed to tell people that she was the captain's daughter to keep the existence of the Chiss navigators a secret. These journeys within the Chiss Ascendancy served as tests for aging Skywalkers, as the risks were significantly lower compared to the dangers in the wider Chaos region. If a navigator faltered, the helm officer could easily correct the course and ensure safety. Despite Alistov's distress over her navigation failure, Thrawn provided solace, encouraging her by mentioning the myriad potential career paths a captain's daughter could pursue. Though she knew that was just her cover story, his uplifting words left a profound impact on the young girl leading her to aspire to join the Myth family once she retired from the Skywalker Corps. 
Years later, she would become a merit adoptive of the Myth family, known as Myth Aliastav, core name Thalias, and she would long to journey with Ron again, simply to see him. In the midst of this heartening encounter with Alistav on the Tamra, Junior Captain Vorlip arrived on the bridge and reprimanded the new cadet for trespassing in a restricted area. Testing Thrawn's instincts, she instructed him to close his eyes, spun him around to disrupt his balance, and then asked him to indicate the direction of the ship's bow. Impressively, Thrawn accurately identified the direction despite this being his first time in space, earning Vorlip's respect. And though she dismissed him, cautioning him to seek clearance before entering restricted areas in the future, she confided in Alastov that it had taken her over a dozen space journeys to develop such a keen sense of direction. Nevertheless, the captain penalized Thrawn with 50 down marks for breaching the restricted area. Upon arriving at the academy, he would have to work diligently for three months just to make amends for these demerits. This incident marked an early test in Thrawn's journey demonstrating his resourcefulness, empathy, and resilience amidst the challenges of a career within the Chiss Ascendancy military ranks. Shortly after arriving at the Taharim Academy on Naporar, Thrawn was invited to a rematching dinner at the Myth family compound on Avidich for orientation. Those in attendance were unaware of the deep pain Thrawn carried for his older sister, whose star day coincided with this rematching dinner, saddened by the loss of his three-year-old sister. Thrawn was warmly welcomed by Aristocra Mithras Safas, affectionately known as Thras, who held the rank of cousin within the Myth family. Little did either Thrawn or Thras know that Patriarchs Duraki of the Myth family and Stimlamiu Vodu, Lamov of the Stibla family, had already had a plan in motion to forge a strong friendship between Thrawn and Thras. Recognizing Thrawn's exceptional combat talents and Thras's political acumen, they believed this alliance would elevate the Myth family to new heights and reinforce a long-standing but discreet friendship between the Myth and Stibla families. Thrawn's induction into the Myth family typically involved a formal welcoming ceremony at Avidich before proceeding to Naporar. However, an exception had been made for Thrawn, leading Thras to surmise that a high-ranking family official had been keen on having Thrawn join the fleet as quickly as possible. Thras was astonished when Thrawn astutely identified several artworks in the compound as creations of a female artist who had recently experienced a tragic family loss. These works had indeed been crafted by the historical myth matriarch Mythoso Rosodo, the tragic, who had lost all four of her sons in battle during the final assault on Scylla. Thras sensed a deep personal loss in Thrawn's past, but the young cadet kept these secrets locked away, veiled behind his enigmatic eyes. Seeking to engage the new cadet in understanding his interest in art, Thras extended an offer to show him an extensive collection of artwork available at the Avidich compound. Curious about the duration of Thrawn's stay at Avidich, Thras discovered that Thrawn had been granted only one night there. Eager to prolong this mysterious man's time on the planet, Thras believed that getting him to stay for an extra night would result in only a few down marks and assured him that the Myth family could have those demerits waived. To Thras's surprise, Thrawn revealed that he had already accumulated those 50 down marks, and perplexed by how Thrawn earned so many demerits, Thras learned of the political intricacies that enabled Thrawn's presence that night. Avidich's Erezi family Patrio was in attendance at the rematching dinner. As rivals to the Myth family, the Erezi family aspired to dominate the Ascendancy military, including Bakif's newly formed expansionary defense fleet. To showcase three military rematches to the Erezi family instead of two, Patriarch Thuraki had requested Colonel Wavery, leader of the Taharim Academy, to grant Thrawn a one-day pass to Avidich, aware that Thrawn needed to return to Naporar soon. Thras offered to show him the Patriel's art collection and describe the grand art gallery at the Myth family homestead on Scylla. Though Thrawn declined the offer, he expressed interest in examining art with the Aristocra on a future occasion. During his time as a student at the Tarim Academy, Thrawn consistently ranked among the top performers in his class. However, there was an incident where he was accused of cheating on a combat simulation exam overseen by senior cadet Arizi R. Alani, core name Ziara. Thrawn's score on the exam was so remarkably high that it raised suspicion, leading to these cheating allegations. In truth, Thrawn was innocent, having devised a brilliant stealth maneuver during the simulation. But since these simulation scenarios could not be replicated, something put in place precisely to prevent cheating, now it meant that they couldn't generate the same parameters in the simulation. But having achieved a score that was several deviations higher than anything ever recorded, many felt the only conclusion was that he somehow cheated. 
Faced with the possibility of expulsion from the Academy, Thrawn's only hope was Ziara, who intervened on his behalf, bringing General Bakif into the matter. Bakif proposed an alternative, a combat exercise using the same parameters as the contested simulation. The randomized computer program might not be able to replicate it, but they could try and play it out in real ships. And in this exercise, Thrawn repeated the evasive maneuver, vindicating himself and showcasing his strategic brilliance. The first attack against Thrawn would have opened up his aft oxygen reserves and fuel tanks, spewing both gases into space behind him, and fired the thruster burst those escaping gases would have ignited, temporarily blinding the attacker's sensors. I'm Thrawn fired the two's aft thrusters, damaging them in a precisely specific pattern that not only temporarily knocked them out, but also gave the ship a predictable wobble. Matching the pattern and hiding behind the ship, he then waited just long enough for one and three to turn their attention elsewhere, then came out and fired before they could respond. In gratitude for Ziara's support, Thrawn invited her to celebrate his acquittal with a night out. Instead of a traditional celebration with music and inebriating drinks, Thrawn took her to an art gallery to analyze alien artwork and glean insights into their military tactics. Utilizing the opportunity, Thrawn shared his knowledge with Ziara, teaching her how to analyze art for tactical info. Ziara then invited Thrawn to her quarters, where she displayed her sculptures. Proposing a sparring match with soft coat sticks, seeing what he could tell about her from her artwork. Thrawn would emerge victorious, impressing Ziara with how he understood that she would fight with certain styles, just based on the artwork she chose. During their interaction, Thrawn's keen observation and deduction caused Ziara to blush, as he correctly inferred her honorable nature and reluctancy to employ dirty tricks against an opponent. This encounter marked a turning point in Thrawn's academy life, solidifying his reputation not only as an exceptional strategist, but he seemed more relatable and became an esteemed peer among his fellow cadets. Around 37 BBY, two years after being rematched into the Myth family, Thrawn successfully graduated from the Taharim Academy and with a lieutenant's commission in the Chiss Expansionary Defense Fleet. During this time, Aristocra Thras had been keeping tabs on Thrawn's progress, but the two hadn't seen each other since that rematching dinner. Unexpectedly, Patriarch Thuraki summoned Thras to his office and tasked him with a seemingly trivial mission. Convince Thrawn to remain with the Myth family, rather than joining the Stibla family as a trialborn. With this trialborn status being a promotion from merely a Myth family merit adoptive. Unbeknownst to Thras, Patriarchs Thuraki and Lamayov had orchestrated this all as a test. They wanted to see whether Thras would openly declare his friendship with Thrawn, still pushing for this friendship that could benefit both families. To fulfill this mission, Thras traveled from Scylla to Naporar to meet Thrawn for lunch at a bistro. As he waited, a peculiar chiss named Stibla Pippin Psykok, senior aide to Stibla Patriarch Lamayov, decided to join Thras uninvited. The Stibler representative informed Thras that they intended to extend an offer of rematching to Thrawn and challenged Thras to offer something better. Mindful of his duty to keep Thrawn with the Myth family, he dismissed Stibler's intentions, stating that they merely saw Thrawn as a pawn in their family's political games. But in his defense of Thrawn, Thras surprised himself by admitting that he considered Thrawn to be a friend, which was exactly the intel the Stibler rep was looking for. When Thrawn arrived exactly 10 minutes after Thras, Aristocra's declaration of friendship had a significant impact on the unfolding conversation. Thrawn introduced himself to the strange Chiss, unaware of the plot behind the meeting, and to Thras' astonishment, the Pinsic abruptly departed, leaving Thrawn and Thras alone. It was only then that Thras realized the purpose of this encounter was to test his loyalty and friendship with Thrawn. He decided to forget all the politics and just enjoy this lunch. Eager to learn more about Ziara, who he knew had saved Thrawn's career from the cheating allegations. Thrawn humbly downplayed the impact that his live performance gave. No matter the case, Thras promised to retell the story, using it as an opportunity to showcase the greatness of the Myth family. Joking that when he does tell it, the only thing he'll change is the level of smugness in his voice. As a Chiss officer, Thrawn's rise through the ranks of the Chiss Expansionary Defense Fleet was accompanied by both admiration and more controversy. It had always been a practice that the Force-sensitive Skywalker Corps was kept a secret, and so they would hire Pathfinder navigators from the Navigators Guild for their services, making sure their alien neighbors all assumed that the Chiss also relied on the Navigators Guild for their sole means of being able to travel through hyperspace. 
During Thrawn's time as a junior commander on a Chiss diplomatic cruiser, the Ascendancy was dealing with pirates attacking their shipping freighters in the outer reaches of their territory. On one occasion, while heading to Bardramskov to meet with the new prefect, Thrawn and the crew stopped at the Guild Concourse 447 to hire Pathfinder Quilori of Uandalon in order to guide them through hyperspace. Quilori's navigation skills proved invaluable, ensuring the ship's timely arrival at Bardramskov. Upon reaching the planet, Thrawn and Quilori were alone on the bridge. He explained their situation and that they observed a ship belonging to another nation, resembling the pirates' crafts that had been attacking Chiss freighters. Though the Pathfinder suspected the ship to be from the Leoan regime, he couldn't divulge the information due to the guild's neutrality rules. Thrawn's astute observations and deductions, however, led him to believe that the pirates were indeed connected to the Leoan regime, and he also sensed that Quillori might be aware of this connection, knowing that he would cover it for the guild. Following this meeting, Thrawn conducted further research and discovered the secret that Pathfinders could track each other through hyperspace. Armed with this knowledge, he proposed a response to the pirate attacks to General Bakif, suggesting attacking the pirates without engaging the Leoan regime directly, despite the strict laws against preemptive strikes in the Ascendancy. He promised not to act unless he could accurately distinguish between enemy and neutral ships. Bakif, aware of the political implications and the need to project strength, approved Thrawn's request for three ships to deter future pirate attacks. While concerned about Thrawn's self-assurance, the general understood the importance of addressing these ongoing strikes, which tarnished the Ascendancy's reputation in the chaos. Thrawn's strategic brilliance and unwavering determination to protect the Ascendancy set him apart, but this would be the beginning of his critiques of using unprovoked strikes. With this mission approved, Thrawn and Kilori traveled to the Leo and Heartworld aboard a freighter, unaware that another Chiss ship, also guided by a member of the Navigators Guild, had arrived as well. Thrawn noticed the resemblance between Leo and patrol ships and the pirate craft, but Kilori remained skeptical. Despite being too deep in the Heartworld's gravity well to escape through hyperspace, Thrawn piloted the ship even closer to confirm his suspicions. As they approached a repair center with two patrol ships, Thrawn reasoned that one of them had recently raided the Massa system, but Kilori protested, fearing the involvement of the regime with the pirates. Thrawn questioned how he could be so certain of this, but the navigator denied any knowledge. Now insisting on leaving, concerned that Pathfinders on the Leo and Corsairs could track them through hyperspace. Thrawn decided to eliminate any doubts about the pursuit of pirates, transmitting a message in a trade language known to the Leoan, confirming that they had found the pirates and ordering the second Chiss ship to flee. As they made their escape, Thrawn revealed his plan to bait the Leoan pirates at their homeworld. He believed that the pirates used pathfinders as well and had set a trap for their pursuers. Kilori received visions of the pursuing ships, causing them to revert to real space twice in order for him to reconnect to the Force. Throughout the journey, Thrawn remained silent during these pauses, and upon arriving at the Kinaw system, four Leoan Corsairs emerged from hyperspace, confirming Thrawn's strategy. He confronted Kilori about the Pathfinder's ability to track each other through hyperspace, but even now the navigator denied this. Thrawn explained that the Pathfinder's style had been part of the latest pirate attack, and he hoped to lure the pirates into a trap at the Heart World before the Pathfinders returned to their base stations. Soon, a cruiser under the command of Thrawn's colleague, Mid-Captain Ziara, confronted these four enemy ships. She suggested that Thrawn and Kilori continue on their present course to witness the pirates' eventual defeat. This engagement marked the beginning of the Ascendancy's Leoan pirate campaign, thanks to Thrawn's strategic brilliance, foresight, and playing loose with the rules of engagement. After the skirmish in the Kinaw system, General Bakif promoted Thrawn up two ranks, making him a senior commander, while Ziara was also promoted to senior captain for her role. The following year, Thrawn served as the fourth officer aboard the patrol cruiser Parala, which was under the command of senior captain Ziara. One fateful day, the Parala received a distress call from security officer Frangelic on the Garwan colony of Stivik. The planet and its orbital merchant hub were under attack by Leolan pirates, just like what the Chiss had experienced. Thrawn was eager to intervene and help the Garwians, but Ziara hesitated. She understood that stepping in would violate the Ascendancy's non-aggression laws and jeopardize her career. However, she found a loophole in the EDF's mandate. They were allowed to provide humanitarian aid to other nations and assess threats beyond the Ascendancy's borders. She decided to bring the Parala out of hyperspace and observe the skirmish at Stivik using the pretext that these were the same pirates that they had encountered at Kinos, and thus it would be prudent to assess this threat. 
Thrawn, with his exceptional tactical insight, quickly identified the weakness and blind spots of the Leoan Corsairs. He offered to help Ziara defeat the pirates without any damage to the Parala. She refused to engage them directly, but did allow Thrawn to calibrate the Parala's ranging lasers. Secretly, Thrawn was using this to send a modulated laser message to the Garweans, revealing the vulnerabilities he had discovered in the Leoan ships. As soon as the Garweans received Thrawn's message, the tide of the battle turned in their favor. Only Ziara knew that Thrawn was the mastermind behind this victory. Despite her initial hesitation, she informed her first officer, Rosku, that her precious cafes aboard the merchant hub had been saved, hinting at Thrawn's incredible contribution to this unexpected outcome. Again, Thrawn was getting dangerously close to violating the rules of non-engagement, while also proving his brilliance to more and more people in the Ascendancy, even to their alien allies. And it wasn't long after the Stivic incident that Mid-Captain Rosku lodged a disciplinary report with the Defense Hierarchy Council, accusing Thrawn and Ziara of violating the Ascendancy's non-intervention policy. The involvement of Rosku's Klar family speaker brought the Syndicure into what would have typically been a solely military matter. In response, Syndic Thurfian chose to include the Myth family in the inquiry. General Bakiv came to Thrawn and Ziara's defense, which led Rosku to perceive favoritism within the Ascendancy military. A month later, Rosku faced charges for a minor protocol infraction, and no one supported her. The EDF offered her the choice of official discipline or a quiet departure, leading her to join the Klar family fleet, in nature a lasting resentment towards Thrawn and Ziara. Four months after the pirate attack on Stivik, the Parala's officers were summoned to Scylla for debriefing and testimonies before the Council at Defense Force HQ. Among those called to testify was Thrawn. Coincidentally, Thras had been promoted to Syndic during that time. As the newest Myth family representative in the Syndicure, Thras handled menial tasks assigned by more senior Syndics. Thurfian, one of the few Myth Syndics overseeing Chiss Defense Force and expansionary defense fleet operations, entrusted Thras with a data cylinder containing part of the Parala's autolog record of the Stivic incident. Thurfian wished to keep this information confidential, limited to the Myth family Syndics only. Thras realized that the data cylinder held evidence related to someone on the Parala potentially intervening in alien affairs, pulling off some sort of deceit and it became apparent that Thurfian aimed to uncover any misconduct committed by Thrawn during the Stivic incident. Thras speculated that Thrawn might have found himself in serious trouble over the matter, and Ziara sought to shield him from the consequences, resulting in both being prominently featured in the report. While Chiss families were known to protect their own, adhering to the maxim, family sides with family, Thras sensed that Thurfian's animosity towards Thrawn surpassed his loyalty to the Myth family. Despite this, Thras remained uncertain of whether the senior syndics wished to indict or vindicate Thrawn. Thras delved into the records of the Parala's ranging laser's modulated fire, which Rosku had previously alleged showed rapid fluctuations. He began analyzing the pattern of frequency fluctuations against known encryptions and various languages, starting with the primary Chiss language, Chun, and proceeding through trade languages like Tarja and Cybisti. However, the frequency modulations did not match any known conventional pattern in those languages. Thras intentionally left Mini Saya toward the end of the language list, buying time as he sought evidence to question whether the frequency modulation was intentional. But as he continued his cryptographic and linguistic analysis, he discovered evidence that proved that it might just be a coincidence. He noticed the modulator disc of the laser had been replaced shortly after the Stivic incident. Considering that such modulators were prone to occasional malfunctions, resulting in rapid frequency shifts, Thras deduced that the prior modulator on the Parala had likely experienced such a malfunction. Unfortunately, since that replaced modulator had been broken down to scrap parts and recycled, it was impossible to definitively ascertain if it had malfunctioned. Moreover, the log of the parts replacement did not contain information about who performed the fix or the reason for this replacement, adding further intrigue to this investigation. With his conclusions in hand, Thras reported his findings to Syndic Thurfian. Thras used his explanation to provoke Thurfian into personal attacks, effectively steering the older Syndic away from the original goal of indicting Thrawn. Although Thurfian's initial animosity towards Thrawn had led him down a path of bias, Thras believed that loyalty to family and friendship were essential foundations for the Chiss society. He was determined to protect his friend Thrawn, and to uphold the Myth family's potential for greatness. With the matter seemingly settled, he pondered the wise words of Patriarch Thuraki, who had recognized Thrawn's potential to elevate the Myth family's prestige and power. 
Thras knew he had made the right choice in safeguarding his friend's reputation. Following this, Thrawn received his first command, the patrol ship Boko. During a routine patrol, the Boko received a distress call from a Chiss excursion liner owned by the Bondil family. The liner, carrying 8,000 people, was crashing through the atmosphere of a gas giant, with its thrusters and escape pods malfunctioning due to the intense magnetic bands and radiation. Thrawn sprang into action, knowing every second was crucial, and despite the vast difference in size between the patrol ship and liner, he activated the Boko's tractor beams in an attempt to pull the massive ship out of its deadly descent. But this wasn't enough to stabilize the liner, and so he shot off an emergency message to Ziara. And as the Parala arrived just in time, Thrawn explained that the passengers were gathered in the central cylinder, which still had functional shielding, and moved to fire the Boko's spectrum lasers upon the liner's port and starboard wings, knocking them off in order to lighten its mass. Some of Ziara's officers were initially taken aback, as they watched Thrawn's ship opening fire on the very liner they were supposed to rescue. By now, Ziara knew how to take Thrawn's lead, and the two worked together flawlessly. She diverted all emergency power to strengthen her ship's tractor beam, pulling the now lighter passenger liner away from the planet's grasp. The Boko swiftly returned to the Parala side, reactivating its tractor beam and thrusters to assist in the rescue. After 15 tense minutes, the liner was successfully pulled out of the planet's atmosphere and gravity well, securing the lives of all 8,000 on board. Thrawn thanked her for responding, while she was still impressed by his quick thinking. But she warned him that their efforts might face opposition from some of the wealthier passengers, as blowing off those wings would have resulted in the loss of countless valuables, especially because the luxury suites were all along the wings. They both knew that saving lives took precedence, but in their political system full of vain ruling elites, they knew someone would be complaining. It was after this that he was summoned to a high-level hearing on Scylla. This was Thrawn's first time setting foot on Scylla, and he was accompanied by Ziara, who tried to reassure him that he had a political advantage in the hearing due to the presence of Aristocra from various ruling families along with the saved passengers. And Thrawn resented how these petty politicians worked their way into everything. As they descended to Scylla's surface, he asked if the city they were approaching was Saplar, the capital city of the Ascendancy. Ziara confirmed it was, and mentioned that it had once been a center of culture, and Thrawn, still under the belief of that commonly spread lie, believing it to be heavily populated, was surprised that a city of 7 million could not support both arts and government. Ziara knew the population figure was vastly inflated, and she promised to reveal the truth to Thrawn later. The hearing proved to be contentious, with representatives from the Baudel family demanding punishment for Thrawn, while others argued for commendation and promotion. In the end, the aristocracy's claims and counterclaims balanced out, leaving Thrawn without a promotion or demotion, but they did strip him of his command of the Bako. Ziara was outraged by this outcome and apologized to Thrawn as they traveled back to Saplar. She offered him a position on the Parala and lodging at her family's homestead, despite the intense rivalry between the myth and Arisi families. Indignant at their political overlords, she was determined to show Thrawn the truth about Scylla, arranging an unconventional tube car ride across the capital. Thrawn quickly realized the contradiction between what he had been taught and the reality he was seeing. Ziara explained that Scylla had undergone an exodus thousands of years ago due to the freezing of the planet's surface. Only a few hundred Chiss remained above ground in Saplar, while the true cities were all underground. She explained the tactical purpose of this deception, protecting Scylla from potential attackers by presenting a false image of a thriving capital. He understood that such detailed knowledge of Scylla was restricted for someone of his rank, but she assured him that he would be promoted soon, and just asked that he look surprised when he did get the briefing. As they arrived at the Ziara family homestead, Thrawn asked if she had informed her family about his stay, but she had not, assuring him that it wouldn't cause any trouble, though Thrawn was skeptical. Nevertheless, he appreciated that she told him the truth about the city. In a few weeks after his stay, Thrawn received a summons to the office of Aristocra Erizi Stalmustro, core name Zestalmu. He arrived at the specified time and was welcomed by the Aristocra, who acknowledged the commander's growing reputation and dedication within the Ascendancy. Zestalmu hinted at problems with Thrawn's myth family and offered him a recruitment opportunity into the Erizi family. Aristocra explained that Thrawn could become a trial-born of the Arisi, a promotion that would exempt him from undergoing the trials. As the Arisi family considered his exemplary service in the defense fleet a sufficient substitute, and this promotion would accelerate his path into higher ranks of the Chiss society. Although honored and humbled by the offer, he was unsure about leaving the Myth family and said he just wanted time to consider the proposal. Before parting, Thrawn mentioned that the Arisi already had a distinguished military officer in Senior Captain Ziara. 
However, Zistalmu cryptically hinted that Ziara's status as an Arizi might not last for long. It wasn't long after this that Ziara was promoted to the rank of Commodore, which also had the effect of removing her from the Arizi family, now just being our Alani. During her promotion celebration, Thrawn sought advice from Erelani about whether he should join the Arezi family. She shared her discomfort with the Arezi family's dominance in the military, but ultimately left the decision to Thrawn. He expressed his gratitude for her support over all these years. She then revealed that she had requested the Defense Hierarchy Council to appoint Thrawn as her first officer, and invited him to a quiet place for a celebratory drink, where he could share more of his goals for the Ascendancy that might not be publicly acknowledged. After her promotion, the Garian Unity invited her and Thrawn to their capital planet, Solitaire, under the pretense of expressing gratitude for their aid during the Stivic Incident. However, the Garians had ulterior motives. Seeking to exploit the Chiss officers to learn more about the Leoan's tactical weaknesses for a planned campaign in Leoan space. In response, the Leoan regime dispatched two diplomatic vessels to Solitaire in an attempt to negotiate a surrender to the Garians. Before the diplomats arrived, Thrawn and Aralani had been treated as esteemed guests, fully immersed in Garwian culture. The Garwians took pride in their artistry, boasting numerous creators' markets that displayed exquisite handcrafted items, including clothing, artwork, and delicacies. During their stay, Aralani admitted to Thrawn that she had started to see non-Chiss as individuals, a perspective she had not held before. She believed that Thrawn had always recognized the personhood of non chiss and considered this a strength of his. In response, Thrawn's Demeter turned cold, as he asserted that he viewed non chiss as assets first, and people second. When the Leoan diplomatic ships approached the planet, the Garwians staged a false attack, pleading with Thrawn to lead a counterattack for their forces. Aralani intervened just in time to prevent Thrawn from unwittingly supporting the Garwian aggression. But in the process, Thrawn inadvertently revealed some tactical information about the Leoan. Subsequently, the Garwians attacked the diplomatic ships, causing them to broadcast surrender and distress signals. Both Chiss officers felt angered and manipulated, as their non-aggression principles had been compromised. Before departing Solitaire, they issued stern warnings to the Garwians, vowing that the Chiss ascendancy would never be crossed again. These actions on Solitaire provoked the anger of the Defense Hierarchy's councils, resulting in his demotion from Senior Commander to Mid Commander. After departing Solitaire and nearing the Ascendancy, Arlani summoned Thrawn to her office, and he took responsibility, apologizing for nearly violating the Ascendancy's non-aggression laws, saying he should have recognized the Garwian's manipulative intentions. But she rejected this, stating that she should have been the one to see through them, and she said that his failure here was just due to his lack of understanding in politics and how these leaders were almost always honorless and driven solely by power and prestige. Thrawn asked for her help in understanding politics, and while she acknowledged it was useful, she thought it might be the one thing he was incapable of mastering, describing him as tone-deaf to the many intricate and self-serving maneuvers of politics. Despite his demotion, the Defense Hierarchy Council assigned Thrawn a new command, the Chiss heavy cruiser Springhawk. They considered placing him and his command ship in Picket Force 2 on the Ascendancy's eastern zenith border, far away from the Garwians and Leoe. The Arezi family, who had previously offered Thrawn a position as an Arezi trialborn, now presented him with the opportunity to join them as a ranking distant, a higher rank than trialborn. In response, Thrawn's own myth family extended an offer of trialborn status without the requirement to undergo the trials. Aristocra Thurfian was furious, believing that these families were rewarding Thrawn for a reckless and politically risky act. While Speaker Thistrian argued that keeping Thrawn in the family might bring them glory, leading Thurfian to suspect that the Arezi were bluffing, and thus they would desperately cling on to this man that would only bring them embarrassment or disgrace. Thurfian questioned who Thrawn's high-ranking benefactors might be, with Thistrian speculating that it could be General Bakif or Admiral Jafosk from the fleet side. As for the Myth family, Thistrian could not conclusively determine if it was Patriarch Thuraki. Shortly before he was set to officially assume control of the Springhawk and Picket Force 2, Ron received a mission from Patriarch Thuraki. The Stibliff family required him and Syndic Thras to report to their stronghold on the Porar. In the Stibla Patriarch's office, Lamayev explained that 12 hours earlier, one of their cargo ships had fallen victim to pirates along the Ascendancy planet's Bosia, while en route from Scylla to Naporar. The pirates had cunningly disguised their ship as a transport belonging to the Obik family, another ruling family who recently formed a delicate alliance with the myth. Thras inquired about the composition of the Sposia Orbital Security Forces, which was a mix of Klar, Obik, Sap, and Krinku family crews and ships. 
These four families collectively took charge of the planet's security duties. Thrawn asked about the management of the orbital security patrol schedule, but the man clarified that it was shared among the four contributing families, and there was no evidence of a conspiracy to withdraw security forces from the Stibla cargo ship. The Stibla authorities presented Thras and Thrawn with three security recordings of the attack, with only one capturing the events leading up to the assault. As the pilot who recorded both parts was from the Klar family, Thrawn deduced that the pirate attackers were affiliated with the Klars. Thras said they should detain the Klar patrol pilot, the one who made the recordings, and urge the Mayav to immediately contact Patriarch Klar Iv Aksal, corename Rivlix, who would be found on the planet Rygar. Lepincic revealed that the Klar pilot responsible for the recording was already safely in custody, and Lamayoff mentioned that Rivlex likely knew about the attacks, since they were receiving reports of high-level communications between Rivlex's office and Sposia ever since the pilot's detention. The Stibla Patriarch emphasized that Rivlex knew about the theft and was now attempting to track down the hijackers, and thus he was aware of something crucial that had been on the Stibla cargo ship. Afterward, Lamiov dismissed Thrawn and Thras to a waiting room to continue their analysis of the theft, while he contacted Patriarch Rivlex. Thras acknowledged their duty to serve at Lamiov's command until Patriarch Thuraki stated otherwise. Thrawn raised concerns about the impact of the delay on his scheduled command of the Springhawk, which was supposed to be in just three hours, fearing possible repercussions from his superiors. Lamayev assured Thrawn that he would speak to General Bakif and ensure that there would be no negative consequences, while Lepinsik led the two myth friends to the lounge. Here, Thrawn revealed to his friend that the Patriarch seemed interested in one particular item, and this must have been the reason for the ship's hijacking. Thras noted that Thrawn seemed frustrated when Lamayev and Lepinsik declined to engage in a guessing game called Riddle Me, asking Thrawn to explain how he had determined the Klar family's guilt instead of letting them piece together the puzzle on their own. Thrawn expressed his disappointment, claiming that it was right in front of them, but his friend reminded him that he had a rare gift of insight. Most people didn't see things as he did, and that surely Lamayev noticed this about Thrawn as well. Within the Ascendancy's criminal law agreements, more severe punishments were prescribed for individuals of higher family status who committed crimes against other families. In extreme cases, a blood relative of a family committing theft or manslaughter could profoundly strain family relationships. For instance, if a cousin or blood-ranked member of one of the Chiss families killed a member of another family, that perpetrator would immediately face the death penalty. However, this penalty could only be carried out if the victim's family captured the offender, incentivizing families to police their own members, to both prevent and punish crimes against other families. In certain scenarios, neither family might want to execute the perpetrator, leading to a quiet resolution if the offender's family apprehended them first, never officially recording the crime. For three hours, Thrawn and Thras continued their investigation, while Patriarch Rivlex tried to delay Lamayov. Thrawn suggested they would eat on the ship, astonishing Lamayov with his ability to deduce the plan. Thras was lost, however. Cryptically, Lamayov asked how he knew, without specifying what it was, and Thrawn explained that Rivlex was likely unaware of the special cargo, just hoping to capture the thieves of his own family before his rivals did. He further pushed that the Klar patrol pilot hadn't been involved in the attack, but rather was working as an agent of Patriarch Rivlex, who informed him that the supposed Abic transport might actually be a pirate vessel. Rivlex and the patrol pilot had refrained from altering patrol command because they were uncertain whether the attack would occur, fearing that any alteration would tip off the hijackers and prompt them to attack elsewhere. Considering the tiered penalty clauses in the criminal law agreements between the Klar and Stibla families, Thrawn deduced that at least one of the hijackers was a Klar, with the high family rank of cousin. Lamayov corrected him, revealing that the hijackers were even higher ranked as blood. Under usual circumstances, the Stibla might have negotiated with the Klar family to settle the hijacking, but since the stolen cargo was a piece of the ancient Star Flash weapon, it was too crucial to be left in the hands of the Klar family. Thrawn assured him that he would deliver the lost cargo to the Stibla Patriarch, while Thras finally realized why Patriarch Thuraki had put them on this mission. It was all in pursuit of that weapon. Lamayev agreed to let Thrawn try and recover the cargo, along with General Bakif's suggestion, and the two set off in the patrol ship Jandalin, accompanied by Lepinsik and a Stibla family pilot. Lamayev admitted that he had initially believed Thuraki and Bakif had exaggerated their investigative and deductive skills, but now he was seeing why Thrawn was rising so quickly. He informed the two myth that the Klar patrol pilot had sent two transmissions, one to Cormit and the other to Rygar. Rygar was the location of the Klar family homestead and was a center of influence in the Klar family. Cormit housed a Klar fleet depot, where the Klar family's light cruiser Orison was docked. 
From the fact that the transmission had been sent from Spozia to Cormit, Thrawn believed that the hijackers were headed to the galactic southeast, possibly exiting the Ascendancy via a border world. He knew that smugglers chose border worlds as rendezvous points with clients on a rotating schedule, usually shifting monthly. He further speculated that Rivlex had kept Lamayev on the comm for three hours, while saying he was trying to negotiate an agreement, was really providing the Klar family with time to determine the hijacker's destination. However, unlike the Klar family, Theron believed he knew their target, Glastis III, a remote and seldom used Chiss Defense Force Emergency Repair Black Dock located midway between Scylla and the Ascendancy planet Copero, toward the Ascendancy's south Nader border. With a Pinsic in the Stibla pilot, Thrawn and Thras embarked on the Jandalin to head to Glastis III. The Black Dock orbited a planet considered marginably habitable, but no Chiss family had colonized or deemed it worthy of development. Thrawn reasoned that the Klar family hijackers intended to abandon the cargo ship and its crew in a secluded location, where they would eventually be discovered and rescued, but not quickly enough to allow the pirates to be easily tracked by authorities. If any of the Stibla crew had either died, been kidnapped or gone missing for over a year, the hijackers would be subject to the death penalty, as stipulated in the criminal law agreements between the Klar and the Stibla. And let's call it here for part one of this epic series, as we see Thrawn start to develop his political skills and further refine his military genius, and what will lead to contact with the Republic and the development of his lifelong goal to become a deep undercover operative seeming to serve the will of Emperor Palpatine. If you made it this far, please hit that like button, share the video, leave a comment, and subscribe. Those are all the best ways to help me out. But most important of all, remember, it's called the chaos for a reason, and the Force will be with you. Always.